Hello, everybody. Josh Neighbors here, Locked On Big 12 Podcast. Joining us today, it is the new host of the Locked On Longhorns Podcast. It is Jonathan Davis. We have a whole lot to get to, recruiting, uh, college basketball, all those things coming up on today's show. But first, as always, our intro video. You are Locked On Big 12. Your daily podcast on the Big 12 Conference, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Once again, hello, everybody. Josh Neighbors here, Locked On Big 12 Podcast. As I said before, joining us today, Jonathan Davis of Locked On Longhorns. Jonathan, welcome to the Locked On family, and I'm sure the first of many crossovers between you and I. No, thank you. Definitely. I'm, I'm grateful to be a part of the Locked On Podcast Network. The new host of Locked On Longhorns, as Josh said, and I'm grateful to be here on uh, Locked On Big 12, ready to talk uh, UT football, their recruiting class, uh, some basketball, and just some other things today. Yeah, so I guess where I start, like they had a great class and everything, but you know, as far as it goes, this is the Locked On Big 12 podcast, and obviously the friction between the Texas and the Big 12 is well noted. But I think where, where I am with the football team is, um, I think it's better off for the Texas football that there is actually going to be a bit longer of a wait to go to the Big 12 than we thought, right? We first heard the news. We thought, hey, two years maybe, and then they're dashing. Now, especially with the lack of college football playoff expansion, it just feels like everything is on hold, and maybe we are going to wait until 2025 until we see Texas move on, which I think if you watched Texas football last year, that might be a good thing. And I think if you see any recruiting, if you see the recruiting yeah. too, it's really positive, but – you want a chance to get more of more than one of those classes in and also more than one opportunity to see Steve Sarkeesian try and develop the class because we know with Tom Herman, the issue wasn't recruiting, it was development. Is that is that kind of where mm-hmm. you are? Do you think this waiting is good considering how good the recruiting classes are and kind of where Texas football is? Of course. Uh, when you look at the season last year, they ended it on a six-game losing streak, uh, longest losing streak since 1957, I believe. Uh, and I talked about that on uh, Locked On Longhorns today. I think it's imperative uh, that the University of Texas football program finds that level of success, gets to their first college football playoff while they're still in the Big 12. And when you look at the SEC, look at the championship game last year, Alabama and Georgia looked like they were in a different class than every other university in the nation. And then you still got to talk about teams like Florida, LSU, and Ole Miss. And so I think the University of Texas is easiest path to the college football playoff where there's still only four teams of is winning the Big 12 and getting in that way. And so you talked about it, um, having a fifth ranked recruiting class this year with Steven Sarkeesian. It's about getting in those recruits and developing. And yeah, I think it's, <clears throat> I think it's really important for them uh, to find that level of success before they go to the SEC, because that road is going to get a lot tougher in, in the next few years. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm with you on this. And I, I think that they've got an opportunity because, you know, I, I've been thinking about the Big 12 next season. And despite the fact that Oklahoma lost Lincoln Riley and they lost Kale Williams, they lost all these guys, they're still going to be the favorite next year, in my opinion, just because, I mean, they, they, they still end up having a really nice recruiting class. They have a good foundation, but, you know, you think teams like Baylor might take a slight step back next year. Oklahoma State loses basically all of their defense. And so we think about Oklahoma being a team, you know, Texas, the opportunity is going to be there for Texas. Now they've got to fix a lot of things before they do that. But I mean, you know, if we're talking about Texas in the college football playoff, like in the, you know, in the, their last five years in the big 12 versus their first five years in the sec, I think it's much more likely to end up in a college football playoff in the next five years in the big 12. Definitely. Um, And when you look at it next year, it sets up, Uh, I talked about this on the podcast as well. I think I disagree. I I think that Texas, of Mm -hmm. course, Oklahoma, we know that the pedigree they have, but I do think uh, Texas will be able to make that jump and be the best team in the Big 12 next year. Of course, it's tough. Um, You really can only afford to maybe lose two games. Uh, One probably gets you in Two, It depends on who you lose to. And they play Alabama the second week of the season. So they really kind of have to go flawless uh, through Big 12 play next year, assuming um, that Alabama is going to be heavily favored in that game. Um, but you know, we'll see. I, I think that, uh, UT has a chance, uh, to break through next year. Once again, it's going to be tough, especially with Alabama on the schedule, but you know, like you said, it, it's, it's, it's their best chances are in the next few years rather than towards the end of, uh, you know, the, the 2020s. Yeah. Let's talk about the recruiting class. First, a quick word from our sponsors. Today's show is brought to you by our friends at betonline.net. 
They've got you covered with more props, odds, and lines than ever. BetOnline.net remains the best spot for all of your sports scores, podcast news this season. It's not just football. They've got pro and college hoops, NHL, boxing, UFC, along with real-time updates of current games and Vegas casino games as well. So don't wait to take advantage of all the new amazing offers for the 2022 seasons. Go to Bet Online today. Bet Online, it's where the game starts. All right. So this recruiting class, you know, we heard, I mean, in terms of transfers and new players, Sark had actually said last year, he's like, we might get 30 new guys. Uh, actually, yeah. I think he said we were going to get 30 new guys. 32. 32 is the number when you combine transfers plus recruits that they're going to bring in. And um, they've really focused a lot on the offensive and defensive lines. That's been the big uh, focus for them. I mean, you look at this class, De- uh, Devin Campbell inside, you know, the guy on the, uh, the guy they have on the, uh, on the line, uh, the Kelvin Banks, another guy you're going to have on the offensive line. Um, uh, I don't know how to pronounce this guy's last name. Neto Amuzulu. Uh, yeah. To- <laughs> Yeah, uh, the tap kid is an edge rusher. You know, most of the kids that they got towards the top of their class, that's what they're addressing. And if you watch Texas at the end of last year, they were shot out of a cannon. A lot of their games, they faded down the stretch late, and that's because one personnel and two, they just didn't seem like they were well conditioned enough. So they're going to have the the prospects, the athletes, the kinds of players that you want to compete at the line of scrimmage. The next step is now developing those guys. No, definitely. Uh- Really focused on the trenches, focused on the beef. Uh, 15 out of 28 commits on the offensive and defensive lines. Eight defensive line commits, um, the most out of any position group in this class. And so I thought they really invested there, got the two best offensive linemen in the country. Both went to high school in Texas. You mentioned uh, Devin Campbell, the number nine recruit in the country, interior offensive lineman. And then Kelvin Banks, the offensive tackle out of Humble in the Houston area, number 32 overall in the country. So they really made a, a big emphasis there, got some really good edge prospects. I like Justice Finkley, a four-star edge out of Alabama. Uh, He can play on the edge, and he can slide down to D-tackle. He's a little undersized, about 6'2", 255, um, but he's really strong at the point of attack and can make a lot of noise. I think he'll start off as a a situational pass rusher, but eventually be an every-down player for the University of Texas Longhorns. You know, people have always joked um, with Steven Sarkeesian's time at Alabama uh, that he's going to turn Texas into Alabama West. When you look at this recruiting class, 24 out of the 28 commits are either on the offensive or defensive lines in the defensive backfield or on special teams. Now, we know that Alabama is at the point to where they can recruit any player they want, but that's really still where they win games on the offensive and defensive lines. Um, they've had great pedigree with their defensive backfields. And then, of course, we know a coach like Nick Saban is always um, going to put a huge emphasis on special teams. And I think that's what uh, Steven Sarkeesian did with this recruiting class. Once again, 24 of the 28 uh, commits being on the offensive and defensive lines, the defensive backfield and special teams. But it all starts – uh, with beefing up that offensive line with two five-star offensive line prospects and three four-stars. I think that's going to be a point of emphasis a point of emphasis for them next year uh, with that power run game with the best returning offensive player in the country and B. John Robinson. Yeah, and let's talk about the offense because the defense, defense is, is going to be a work in progress, in my opinion. I, I mean, defenses are never quick no, You're fixes. right, you're right. Yeah, and defense is never be. quick fixes. <laughs> um, offensively, like I thought Texas last year, they – you know, you look at what Sark did with Alabama and you look at what Sark did with with a Texas offense. The concept really isn't isn't different. Get exceptional athletes and get them the football. Now, I think the problem was he didn't have the right quarterback last year. Um, I mm. like I like Case Thompson a lot. I think he's a good player. I just think that team with him was just not a good fit. But their be- their best attributes on offense last year were getting Bijan on the ball, getting Roche on the ball. I thought in some spots, I thought he had a couple of really nice games. And also getting Xavier Worthy the ball. And mm-hmm. they really addressed this in the transfer portal. And, you know, they're, they're going to keep Bijan. They're going to have Xavier Worthy back. But they add the Naylor kid from Wyoming who flips from Tennessee. And then the real question mark to me is, what is Jaleel Billingsley like? Because he is a touted player, but there's a lot of concern about the work ethic, about the desire, about the learning the playbook. You know, there's just a lot of questions but there's a high upside there. So maybe him reuniting with, you know, with the uh, ostensibly one of the offensive coaches that, that, uh, you know, helped recruit him to Alabama could help him going, but it's going to look like they're, they're going to have a variety of weapons. And obviously the big key is Quinn Ewers is, is he this all-star prospect? 
No, definitely. Uh, you talked about Isaiah Nair. Uh, that was a huge flip, uh, getting him to come over from Tennessee uh, to the University of Texas, the real UT. Uh, he had 878 yards and, and 12 touchdowns last year in an offense that only threw the ball 35 percent of the time at Wyoming. So I think you're going to see a huge boost from him. Uh, 6'3", 210, yeah, a really good okay. uh, jump ball player. Yeah, and, and he's going to line up next to freshman All-American Xavier Worthy. Um, and you talked about Jaleel Billingsley, a little disappointing at Alabama, given just kind of, you know, his build um, and his skill set. I think who's going to put a lot of pressure on him is Jatavian Sanders. So people are not talking a lot about him. He didn't play a lot last year. But I think he was the number 16th overall prospect in the 2021 class. Quinn Ewers being the number one overall prospect. He's projected to play at tight end. Didn't get a lot of snaps this year, last year, excuse me. But I think this year he'll be a huge part of the offense. I think you'll see a lot of two tight end sets with Jaleel Billingsley and Jatavian Sanders um, being able to put them as inline blockers. Also, you know, utilize them all over the field as receivers. And honestly, I think with Jatavian Sanders' pedigree and his skill set, he's going to put some pressure on Jaleel Billingsley uh, to kind of revive his career at the University of Texas. And of course, you talked about uh, Quinn Ewers. I thought Casey Thompson was great. I thought Hudson Card uh, was good for the program. But to get to the level of success that Steven Sarkeesian wants, uh, you need not only a floor raiser, but a high ceiling player like that Bryce Young. And I think that's Quinn Ewers, um, the highest graded quarterback prospect at UT since Vince Young. I think he has an NFL ceiling and I look for him uh, to be one of the best quarterbacks in the country next year and probably the best quarterback in the Big 12 if Steven Sarkeesian's offense executes at the level that I think it will. Yeah, there's so many questions. I mean, the, the talent level is is just clearly there. It was interesting that he decided to go to Ohio State just with C.J. Stroud there. I mean, him being a blue chip mm -hmm. you know, guy, too, it's. It was, it was a difficult, I uh, you know, a difficult choice, I think. But now he's back at Texas. I guess the, you know, this might not be a real concern, but I think the national concern is like how, how much of a team leader can he be, or is he too focused on himself? Now we don't, you know, I don't know the kid personally. Not, not yeah. a lot of people do, right? That's the big question: is like, will this thing work? Will he be that leader? Can, you know, because I, I think by all accounts, like everybody really liked Casey Thompson. You know what I mean? Like everybody yeah. really thought mm -hmm. he was a good dude. Can he be like Casey in terms of a guy in the locker room? And can he also be a guy on the field that is a, you know, not quite, I mean, I think Bryce Young's fantastic on real. I think what Bryce Young did with that, that version of Alabama's offense was phenomenal. He didn't have to be that good. I don't mm -hmm. think, but can he yeah. still be a, uh, you know, top two quarterback in the big 12? Yeah, I definitely think so. And, and when you speak about his leadership, um, I don't think he'll have to be right away uh, with B. John Robinson. I think he's going to kind of be the leader. Um, but yes, you're ultimately hoping um, for your quarterback position, Quinn Ewers, to come in and be that leader. Uh, like you said, we don't know him personally, uh, so we don't know what type of personality he has. We're not in that locker room, so we don't know, you know, how uh, the other players are going to respond to him. But I think it's, you know, important for any great team that your best players are also some of the best leaders. And so I think, you know, once again, if they're going to win the Big 12, if they're going to compete for a college football playoff spot, Quinn Ewers is not going to not only going to have to be great on the field, uh, but he's going to have to be a leader uh, in that locker room and get those uh, men in the locker room to follow behind him. So the pressure was put on – it's on Stark right now, I think, for five and seven. But, like, to be honest, I thought last year I, I said seven and five to me would be a decent decent case just because of – the culture at Texas seems to need a huge facelift. I think the pressure is really on Pete Kwiatkowski here. Like, I, I think you could – you can take a maybe a seven and five, eight and four season this year if things look like they're beginning to improve and there's a lot of young guys getting time and they're getting better. I don't know if I don't know if you can take a seven and five, eight and four where the defense gets smashed again. I, and I'm saying for Pete Krakowski, Pete Krakowski say, I mean, you know, seven figures. Uh, he's one of the, the highest paid defensive coordinators. He's got a tall task ahead of him. Do you think Texas is going to have the personnel to kind of really? Uh, improve that defense because here's the thing in a conference where people nationally, people don't get the, you know, people seem to be, you know, whenever a, a high scoring big 12 or a high scoring NFL game breaks out, people are always like, Oh, it's, it's a big 12 football game here. That's mm -hmm. not how it's played anymore. Right. Baylor and Oklahoma state were in the big 12 championship game this year. Those two teams were not based on offense. They were based on defense in a, in a conference that's shifting that way. You think Texas can get their defense close to up to par with everybody else? Yeah. So I think uh, with the success that the offense will have next year, uh, the Texas defense just has to be formidable and not be the reason that they lose games. They were ranked 100th in the country last year. You talked about Oklahoma State. They had 57 sacks as a team. The University of Texas only had 20. Um, so that just shows you, you know, how uh, much of a deficit they were at last year. I think the key is they got three top 100 prospects, the two offensive linemen this year, but also uh, Terrence Brooks out of Little Elm, Texas, four star cornerback. I think he'll play a lot. 
Um, you see Ryan Watts, the transfer from Ohio State, the other transfer um, that no, nobody's talking about because of Quinn Ewers from Ohio State. He made 19 starts in that program. I think he'll come in and start right away. And then the eight defensive line prospects. Um, like you said, you're not going to go from 100th to dominant uh, in one season. But I think with the success of the offense, if the defense can be formidable, obviously they're going to have to get more pressure on the quarterback and the defensive backfield is going to have to play a little bit better. I'm concerned with some of the talent they have at linebacker. I think mm -hmm. that's probably their weakest position group right now. But I do think they'll be better, and I think the offense will be better. And, and like I said, they just have to go out there and be good enough. When you look at a team, they should have not given up 57 points to Kansas. That won't happen again. They had a 21-point lead against Oklahoma. You know, you have to find a way to finish those games. And so you said they fell apart down the stretch, but they should not have been 5-7 and seven last year. That should oh, have been yeah. a 7-5, and 8-4 and four team. And, and I think with the explosion on offense and then more competence on defense this year, they'll be good enough. I mean, they had leads against Baylor, leads against Kansas, leads against Oklahoma, leads against Oklahoma State. Um, I mean, they they had a they had a lot of games, man, where they just they completely fell apart. And it looked like they just ran out of gas, but there was always a turning point where you could see it. And that's the big thing is defense has got to be they've got they've got to hold up uh, at certain points. One more quick word from our sponsors here, and we'll talk some uh, some Texas hoops. Today's show is brought to you by our friends at Get Upside. You guys can download the app wherever you guys get apps at the App Store or Google Play right now. Use the promo code SCORE, S-C-O-R-E, and you guys can get $0.25 cents off per gallon and an extra $0.25 cents off the first time you go to the pump. So don't pay full price at the pump. We know how expensive gas is right now, so go to GetUpside, download that app. Use that promo code, S-C-O-R-E, SCORE, today for $0.25 cents off per gallon, up to $0.25 cents off per gallon at the pump. All right, let's talk some Texas hoops before we get you out of here. Um, I'm a huge Chris Beard guy. I love Chris Beard. I am, I am one of his biggest fans. I thought, externally, I thought he handled the entire going back Texas Tech thing pretty well. There were some, some rumblings about a potential – uh, you know, altercation maybe between him and longtime friend Mark Adams saying that Mark Adams might have been inciting the fans a little bit, which I don't think it's, in, I don't yeah. think it's wrong. <laughs> I don't think it's wrong to say that. But mm. I, I loved, I know he didn't love probably the result. I loved every second of Chris Beard turning. I actually thought Texas fought pretty well. That's a tough place to win in that environment too. Texas, Texas also I mean, they've got a really good shot to win the, to be in the Final Four this year. Um, what were your thoughts on Chris Beard returning to Texas Tech and just kind of overall, you know, the 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 night besides the game? I know the result was tough, but just kind of seeing that happen. No, the atmosphere uh, was amazing. Uh, I really thought I spoke on the podcast. I thought that game should have been on ESPN, not on ESPN two. Yeah. Just with the storyline with Chris Beard coming back, but you know, Auburn being the number one team in the country, they're going to favor them. And and Auburn and Alabama is a a big matchup. Um, but you talked about it. Texas Tech is undefeated at home this year. They're 14 and 0 on their home floor. And, you know, they definitely uh, the fans were, were rowdy on Monday night when when UT got in to Lubbock. They were waiting for him there. Um, they had a, a, a rug. Uh, the fans walked over with Chris Beard's face on it. So Texas Tech was definitely invested in making sure uh, that their fans made that a hostile environment. Um, so, you know, I, I think Chris Beard has done a really good job with this team in his first year. It was disappointing. I predicted that they would win in a hostile environment. Obviously, that did not happen. Texas Tech dominated on all ends of the floor. Got to the free throw line 30 times. I can't mm -hmm. remember the last time I saw a college basketball team get to the free throw line 30 times. They were really just a more aggressive team. Texas was uh, Texas Tech was in the bonus most of the game. So Texas, you know, the way they win games is, is pressure on defense really getting in your face. You can't do that when you're in the bonus the entire game. Every time they got in their face, every time they touched them, it was a foul. And maybe they got some home cooking a little bit with the referees. But overall, Texas Tech came out. They put the pressure on the referees, got to the hoop, made them call fouls. And, and ultimately just wanted the game a little bit more than Texas did. And I think that showed up. Yeah. I, I, with Chris Beard's style, the way that he like gets, he acquires talent. Um, it's difficult because in this league, especially when you get that many new players and they, they mean, they've got so many new players on that team this year, mm -hmm. it's so hard to make them gel and get them to mesh together. Especially you know, it's, I think it's actually a bit easier when you've got freshman guys coming in just because it's like, all right, we're all new. We're all baby giraffes out here. We're all learning together. When mm -hmm. you got a bunch of guys who have played, like they kind of feel more established. And it's like, all right, we got to, you know, we got to figure out how to put this Rubik's cube together. Almost. I, I think it's kind of weird how college basketball, like we look at these teams, it's like, Oh, they got a bunch of good transfers, but it doesn't always coalesce the way that we think it will. 
when you got groups like this. And that's the challenge for Texas right now is there are some nights where they look like a, and I actually thought there were some times in that game where they looked like a pretty cohesive unit. And there's some times where they don't, right? There's some possessions where you're pleased the Marcus Carr tough shot. You know, he's got to grab you a bucket. And there's some times yeah. you're like, dude, move the ball around. Yeah. What are we doing? They're still figuring it out, which in some ways is good because they're still a top 25 team and they haven't played their best ball. But also starting to think, eh, it's February and I'm not sure we've seen Texas play their best game yet. What do you think? No, definitely. Um, I think the broadcasters mentioned it. When you have so many transfers coming in who are used to getting the ball a lot in their programs, but they were on losing programs and they come to the University of Texas and they just want to win. Um, I think sometimes their, their offense, I think they rely on being too perfect in the half court. You mm -hmm. saw uh, Texas Tech really get out, run um, and put pressure on the defense. And I think Texas Tech, I mean, Texas, excuse me, they'll just come down. I think they overpass sometimes. Um, and they end up taking a lot of tough shots at the end of the shot clock. And they really don't have an alpha on the offensive end. They have a lot of good players that can score the basketball um, in isolation situations or down on the post, uh, like Timmy Allen, who transferred from Utah, and then Marcus Carr, who came from Minnesota. But they don't have an alpha. And so sometimes, you know, you just, you know, basketball can be simple at times. Yeah. It can just be, I, 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 say, I said all the time. Yeah, I said a lot. Yes. <laughs> it, give your best player the ball, like Marcus Carr, Courtney Ramey and go get me a bucket. And I think sometimes they're so worried about playing team ball, playing in a winning culture, uh, and, and they overpass, and, and they end up getting a lot of uh, tough shots, tough jumpers at the end of the shot clock. I think they need to find a lot of get, – get to the free throw line easier and just find ways to get easier buckets. But you're right. I don't think they played uh, their best basketball this year. They relied heavily on the defensive end, on the offensive end. Um, they just they, – they struggle at times, right? They, they look as though, you know – that it's really hard for them to score. And so, you know, it's still a little bit early, but with the Big 12 uh, tournament coming up, they have, you know, four out of their next five games against ranked opponents. Yeah, and then, brutal. you know, the NCAA tournament, uh, it's, it's you're kind of at that tipping point where it's like, okay, we still have time to improve. We still have time to figure out, figure it out. But in the same token, uh, you're getting towards the end of the season. You're getting towards that point where you're supposed to be gelling. You're supposed to be playing your best basketball. And I don't know if the University of Texas is there yet. Yeah, they're on a – so I, I think the TCU game was probably the, the game that we saw that was their most complete, right? That was a 23-point mm -hmm. win for them. They're on a stretch right now where they had number 18, Tennessee. They're at Texas Tech, number 14. They're uh, home for Iowa State, who's number 20. They're home for KU's number 10. They're at number 8, Baylor. They're at OU, who is a tournament team at this point in time. And they're home for Texas Tech and TCU. I mean – this this conference, there's I'm not sure we saw this graphic got posted the other day uh, on ESPN. It was like nine toughest remaining schedules. There was mm -hmm. all Big Twelve teams. It was it was yeah. like every single team was in the Big Twelve. And Definitely. this is this while it's a brutal stretch. Like you're not going to win all these games. We, we already know that. But this is a stretch where you can find out. All right, like th these are the kinds of teams we're going to be playing in a tournament, a night at night out basis. There is no crap team in here. There's nobody that's a night off. We, and and each team presents different problems, much like an NCAA tournament. You different teams, different puzzles to solve. I think this is this is the stretch right here where it's like, all right, what does Texas look like going through it and coming out of it? No, definitely. Like you said, there's no nights off. I mean, even that Oklahoma game, that's your bitter rival. So you can't assume that you're going to win that game. Uh, but I think what we're going to find out. I think right now this team has a high floor. I wonder about the ceiling. They're capped uh, offensively, like I said. I mean, you can hold teams to 55 points on the defensive end, that's elite. Um, but when you're, you know, you're just not scoring a lot of points offensively and good offense always beats good defense and everybody competes on the defensive end. You know, I've been watching a lot more college basketball this year and, and it's really so refreshing because in the NBA, you don't see just teams really investing on the defensive end. But I was looking at Texas Tech and I'm like, wow, that's a team full of dogs. I mean, they were picking them up. And they're all like they six in there. They're all at least six, <laughs> six two. That's it. They're, I mean, they're picking yeah. them up full court. They were in yeah. their face. I mean, every team is invested on the defensive end. But the, the problem is, is where these other teams set themselves apart is they consistently score. And you don't see that from the University of Texas. So I think we're going to find out a lot about this team over the next four or five games, really the next five, including that Oklahoma game and then four uh, ranked opponents. And then definitely when Texas Tech comes back to Austin on February 19th, they're going to have to return the favor. Uh, University of Texas fans are going to have to be loud and create a hostile environment, similarly to the way uh, that the Texas Tech fans did for UT and Lubbock. But uh, like you said, really the next four, next four or five games, um, we're going to find out the ceiling of this team. We really already know uh, the floor. This is a really good defensive team, a team with a lot of talent. But how far they'll be able to go in the Big 12 tournament and how far they'll be able to go in the NCAA tournament, uh, ultimately, uh, we'll find that out in the next few weeks. All right, Jonathan, uh, let people know where they can find you, find the podcast, plug everything you like. This is 
your time to shine. Tell people what's coming up on the show, all that kind of stuff. So definitely, uh, John Ball on Twitter, as you can see on the graphic, Locked on Horns on Twitter, Locked on Longhorns, wherever you get your podcast, Locked on Longhorns on the YouTube channel as well. And then also follow Spot on Sports, uh, where I talk a lot of baseball as well. And then we uh, just go through a lot of topics. So John Ball on Twitter, Locked on Horns on Twitter, Locked on Longhorns on all your podcast networks and on YouTube. And then Spot on Sports for all sports coverage, including baseball topics for me. Jonathan Davis. And thank you again, Josh, for having me on Lockdown Big 12. I look forward to doing this a lot in the future. Yes, sir. Uh, this this is the first of many. Appreciate you having a board and uh, it was a lot of fun. So we'll talk to you next time. Thank you.